Good Media, the uh, let me start that over again. Peter Kafka is senior correspondent at Recode, the business and technology network from Vox Media, host of Recode Media, the weekly podcast dedicated to the future of media and technology, and the producer of the Code Media Conference, the live event that uh, hosts hard-hitting interviews with the media and tech industry's leading players. He's been covering media and tech since 97, when he joined the staff of Forbes magazine, and uh, he began writing uh, for All Things D in 2008. Peter, welcome. Hi there. So when is the Code Media Conference coming back? Good question. We, I, I, can't, I can't give you a firm date, but we are optimistic that we'll have something uh, to, ready to go this fall. Nice. Now, did you work with Mossberg? Sure. Yeah. Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher were running All Things D when I joined. Um, and I worked with Walt up until his retirement a couple of years ago. So now that he's retired and it's been about 15 years, I'm going to tell a Walt Mossberg story that I've never told before, at least not publicly. Okay. So I started podcasting in 2005. And, and I was doing interviews with the media about how they use technology to cover the news. And I figured, if I could get Mossberg and I could get Ken Aletta uh -huh. and I could get David Pogue, that would be the trifecta. So I was trying to get Mossberg, trying to get Mossberg. I couldn't get him. And then I heard he liked Cuban cigars. And there was a conference in Los Angeles. It was one of the first TED conferences. And it was at the um, at a at a, uh, a, um, a museum in the hills in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so I got a message to him that uh, I had a couple of Cohibas on me, number twos, and uh, was he available for an interview? And sure enough, he was. And I got the interview in the courtyard of the museum during the conference. And uh, yeah, it was my big get. Yeah, that's a pretty good way to Walt's heart. I don't know if he still smokes, but he definitely uh, smoked uh, like he'd have it at the end of the, the All Things D or Code Conference. He'd go out and have sort of a victory cigar at the end of it. We always had to make sure that his room had a balcony so that he could smoke outside there. He was a big aficionado. I don't remember. I, I, I want to say I think he actually requested Bolivar's torpedoes, but I didn't have them. All I had was Cohibas, which, you know, hey, it's better than nothing. And, I'm not a cigar uh, and, guy, but, but I'm sure Walt had a very specific request for you. So now, so now you've been at this for a while, you know, yeah. you, you've lived through the digital transition. What surprises you most about where we are today? Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, well, let me think about that live in real time. I mean, I think if you go back and look at sort of any sort of set of predictions about how technology would be working into our lives going back to even the late sixties. I think a lot of it, you know, save the jet packs and flying cars. A lot of it is what people had predicted. It comes at different times and in different ways, but there's, I was just looking recently at a clip. It was like an Arthur C. Clarke thing where he's showing how a computer might help you work at home. Um, I may be conflating two different things, um, but we're kind of getting a lot of the future that we predicted. What we didn't predict, right, because it's unforeseen consequences, is there would be unforeseen consequences. So, uh, you know, like a lot of people imagine, the Internet is bringing us 500 channels of TV or more and, and access to the world's information. Um and that all panned out. And what we didn't think about is, oh, who might use the Internet to uh, so mistrust and, and create disinformation and, and do terrible things to people, which were all sort of things that I think had we thought through a little bit, we probably could have seen coming, but you don't. And so we're now, we're, we're constantly in the process of trying to correct for unforeseen consequences. I think. I, I don't admit it often, but I, I went to film school. I wanted to be a film director mm -hmm. and I wound up in PR and now in marketing. Uh-huh. Tell me about, about your arc. Did you set out to be a journalist? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's a pretty, it's a relatively straight line. I was on the school newspaper in high school. I was kicked off, kicked out of it, actually. What high school? Uh, uh, Edina High School in suburban Minneapolis. Um, and then my friends and I did a 
alternative newspaper on our own for a day. Uh, I, I worked, uh, I did much more, I spent much more time at the college newspaper at, at, at school, at the University of Wisconsin, than I did doing anything else. Um, and I imagined that I would leave University of Wisconsin and go work for a small town newspaper and then work for a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one and eventually would get to something like the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And that was the plan that I thought I would get on to and then realized I couldn't. One was going to have a hard time finding a job at a small town newspaper in 1993 and two that I did not want to live in a small town. So I ended up uh, back in Minneapolis near my hometown and ended up working at a business newspaper, the Minnesota Real Estate Journal covering commercial real estate, writing about light industrial warehouses in the Mall of America, um, which is as boring as it sounds like. But it was interesting to me because I'd read Michael Lewis, Liar's Poker in college and thought, oh, there's an interesting way to write about business and maybe I could do that. And so ended up sort of pursuing business journalism that way. Well, uh -huh. you know, the, uh, the real estate news beat at the Minneapolis Real Estate Journal may actually become hot because uh, there was an article, I want to say six weeks ago, maybe two months, uh, that ran on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine titled The Great Climate Migration. And they predicted that the greatest transfer of wealth in the modern world will be landowners who sell their real estate on the coast and in the lower 48 states and, and, and transfer those holdings to the Great Lakes region. Yeah, as someone who owns a home uh, rel relatively close to the East River, I think about that a lot. Um, I live close enough to the water that I can hear foghorns coming from the, Ver the Verrazano Bridge, so I do worry about uh, what that might mean for my property in a few years. Do, do you ever think about maybe going back to Minneapolis? Minneapolis is a nice place. I mean, I'm, I visited there a bit. It's a uh, lovely place to visit in the summer. It's brutally cold uh, from October through April, May, as advertised. Um, the people are nice. Um, there's, there's lots of great stuff there. We sometimes refer to it as the Paris of the Midwest because there's not a lot else around there. So if, especially between there and Seattle, if you're looking for, if you're a young person looking for culture, et cetera, you're going to end up there. Um, but it's very cold. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, I think both for family reasons, but also professionally, it would, even though we've spent the year proving that we can do this work remotely, there's still a lot of benefit to being in a New York or LA or San Francisco, at least for my job. Yeah. So, so tell us a little, walk us through just sort of from an overview standpoint of the Vox media portfolio. Uh, another good question. Um, I think we used to say we had seven or eight brands. They kind of move around, but uh, the most prominent ones are Vox.com, where I work now, um, The Verge, SB Nation, which is where Vox Media sort of got its start, creating this network of, of local sports blogs. Um, folks at Eater, I'm trying to think what else. We've, it's, it's a little confusing because they're moving stuff around. Um, last year, they bought New York Magazine which has been um, a really fun to sort of get to say you work with the folks who work at New York Magazine and they moved in another one of our sites curbed over there. Uh, I'm sure there'll still be some more shuffling around and I'm sure that I am missing some stuff. We also have a significant uh, TV studio business. We're making shows for Netflix and HBO, uh, CNN, uh, and then a podcasting group. Um, the, some of the individual sites have their own podcasts and then um, there's also a Vox Media podcast network um, it's sometimes confusing to figure out which which show belongs to which thing, um, but those are big, important, growing parts of our business. And talk to us a little bit more about the Vox Podcast Network because I think you guys have like two hundred shows, right? Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to speak on behalf of the Vox Podcast Network, but yeah, the the there's it's well, you're all you're all we got, it. you're all we got, so we'll take it. Yeah. Um, again, there's a Vox.com podcast group that used to make like Ezra Klein show. Um, and then there's the Vox Media Podcast Network, which sort of supports those shows, but also works with third parties who have shows. The idea was to sort of expand our reach by adding in folks who don't work dress directly for Vox Media, but might have a podcast they'd like us to distribute and sell ads for. And of course, you've got Recode Media. Yep. How, how hands-on, I mean, as are you just the host or do you actually get involved in uploading the, the, the file? And I mean... I know everyone has to do more with less these days. Yeah, so. I do everything. I, I, I book the show and pr 
I mean, we have a producer I work with, um, but I'm, you know, booking the show. Um, and then um, we have an engineer that we'll send the file to and he'll clean it up a little bit. And, and my producer, the engineer will upload it to the internet and then it comes out. Um, but it's, yeah, there's, it's, I'm pretty hands-on. I'm not actually cutting up tape though. What, what sort of infrastructure do you use to, to host the podcast? Uh, we are now, we have been using uh, during the pandemic something called Squadcast, it's browser-based software, um, works okay. Um, crashes a lot. Uh, we also will sort of do a backup taping. So we'll often ask our guests to tape themselves on their iPhone or I tape myself on QuickTime. Um, but it's pretty low touch. I, prior to the pandemic, I was always insistent that people come into the studio to do the podcast um, to the point where I would like pass on guests because they w either wouldn't come to the studio or we couldn't find a way to do something in person. I insisted on doing that in person because it's much harder for me to conduct an interview remotely. Um, but I've had to do it for the last year. So it'll be interesting when we start going back to the office, how much of those we're going to do remotely and how much we'll do in person again. And are you guys doing dynamic ad insertion? Uh, I don't know. And you should ask someone else of that question. Got it. So, so, um, how would you define Recode's editorial personality? probably changing it you it used to be very personality driven and people like Walt and Kara Swisher and myself and and that was sort of the premise of of recode and all things d was that sort of each person had their own sort of little sphere of influence and their own voice um and over time i think there's less of an emphasis on that although i think some people come to read my work or my colleague jason del rey's work and they know who we are and what we do um and I think as we've been transferring over to Vox, there's been a, and also because like we were talking about at the beginning of this conversation, there's a different sort of conversation about technology that we're having. It's a little bit of a, a sort of reaction to, I think a lot of glowing press that tech got for years, um, but also just a, an acknowledgement that, that tech is complicated. It's, it's omnipresent in our lives. It's also complicated and we should look at it from a bunch of different facets. And I think, the premise of Vox.com is to sort of make, help explain things to a general, a general acquisitive audience. So while the sort of earlier incarnations of all things D and Recode were premised on sort of insider access and we were writing for a pretty informed audience that was wanted to get really in the weeds with us on some stuff, um, oftentimes we're working on stuff that is deliberately meant to reach a larger audience that doesn't presuppose a deep knowledge of ad tech or any, any, anything where, and the idea is that we're supposed to explain that stuff in accessible ways. Um, and that explain to people why they should care about this thing. You know, we're in this environment now where obviously big tech is totally setting the agenda for everything. I mean, just competing against the likes of Amazon for a small and mid-sized business is, you know, difficult to say the least. But, um, you know, you're, you're explaining what's happening in technology to a large audience. Does that supersede you from covering small tech or MarTech or ad tech or any of the smaller niche subjects, which frankly, I mean, if people knew about them, they'd be on able to compete against Amazon. Yeah, I don't know about the letting people compete part. I mean, I even when when All Things D was a more of a niche product, I had deliberately, you know, moved away from writing a lot about ad tech because it was so in the weeds. Even people who are in, in ad tech couldn't really explain it and they certainly didn't know what they were buying. Um, and it was hard to explain why it mattered to even a, a, a relatively niche audience. Um, but figuring out when that stuff is niche and when it isn't is, is always a trick. I mean, blockchain was niche for a long time. Bitcoin was niche for a long time. Now it's mainstream to some degree. Um, so it's a balancing act that we have to do to sort of stay informed about this stuff, have enough access, have enough um, know enough about this stuff that even though we're not covering it day to day, that we can explain it to a bigger group of people. And, you know, periodically I do have to get it, put my ad tech hat on and explain explain why you should pay attention to the fight Apple is having with Facebook over ad tracking. Um, and so you don't have to have covered ad tech a lot for years to be able to tell that story, but it helps if you have. Now, um, talk to us a little bit about how your editorial staff at Recode is organized. 
small staff. Um, I think it's probably about half a dozen of us reporting day to day. So there isn't a whole lot of organization. Um, we're all doing different projects and different stories day to day. It's, we're not, we're not, there's no sort of quota of X number of stories um, that I'm aware of certainly. Um, so a lot of it's just sort of sorting out is this, is there something in the news that we want to help explain to people? Is there something that we're working on that no one's heard of that we want, that we want to spend time on? Do we want to do a short story versus a long story? Um, is this something that we can do with a chart as opposed to, you know, a long, a long block of text and those standard sort of, uh, discussions you'd have in any news, any newsroom. What's the hierarchy? Um, what's your question? Uh, what's the hierarchy? Who's in charge? Uh, the our editor is Sam Altman, who came to us from BuzzFeed. She's great. Um, Ada Clark Estes uh, is her deputy editor. We brought him in from uh, Gizmodo, I believe, and it's a pretty flat organization beyond that. And and how do you make sure? I, this is going to sound like a stupid question, but I think given what we've been going through lately, it's an important question. How do you make sure that what you're publishing is factual? <laughs> uh, uh, it's just kind of the job. It's the base base of the job, right? Is there a process? Is there an editorial process for making sure that it's factual? Um, if we, people, yeah, I'm sorry. It feels like a trick question. I mean, look, I started off as a, I started off as a fact checker at Forbes magazine. Um, and at the time Forbes had a big fact checking group and a few other publications did as well. Um, and you know, people's description of fact checking really varies a lot. Sometimes it just means they Googled something and they found a New York times article that says that that's adequate at Forbes. You used to have to call anyone who had a direct quote and ask them if the quote was accurate. You had to independently verify all this information. So that those processes are just about all gone. I think the New Yorker still has some kind of fact checking process. Um, everyone else is, is, is reliant on their reporters to go out and, and do their work. Uh, they assume that their work is correct. Um, you, you generally have editors to talk to you about the work and it's their job to sort of backstop it. That's about it. Are there any expectations for tri triangulation or um, on the record sources? I mean, is there any sort of, are there any brass tacks rules for something like, you know, a, a real scoop that an editor would want to see to make sure that they're not going too far out on a limb? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, people generally uh, expect me to know what I'm talking about. And that I, if I say I have multiple sources, they assume that's the case. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, we're not, we're generally not doing a lot of deep investigative work. In some cases we are. Um, and in those cases, you know, obviously um, the more delicate the story is, the more buttoned up you want to be. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting to hear my colleague Jason Del Rey talk about a story he wrote recently about uh, black employees at Amazon complaining about discrimination there. Um, and I'm sure that story was much more buttoned up than, you know, a straightforward story about Apple changing its margins on, uh, on what it charges at the App Store. How do, how do you as a team make sure that you're covering the news that matters most? Uh, well, I don't know that we are. I mean, we're at the constant discussion, right? And there's a, um, you know, are you writing about news because it's, it's already in the news and you know that people have an interest in it and so you're sort of meeting that demand? Are you writing about stuff that no one's heard of before? Um, so it's new and then you have to sort of explain to people why they should pay attention to it. Um, we often, I am often asking myself and, and if my editors ask me to write about something, is there anything new I can contribute to this conversation? Um, if I'm literally just writing the same thing that's already been written that I don't know that I'm serving any, anyone any value, there's some temporary value that Vox Media gets because my story will generate X number of page views, but I, I don't necessarily think that's, that's very helpful overall. And, um, and how do you guys make sure that two people aren't covering the same story? Well, we have pretty small staff. So um, we generally have a pretty good idea of what people are working on. But even when we expand it to other folks at Vox.com, there's supposed to be some coordination between editors saying, oh, so-and-so is working on that story. Well, someone else is working on that story as well. That said, um, we will have overlap. I mean, I think, you know, 
someone at Vox.com wrote about the Lincoln Project last summer. I also wrote about the Lincoln Project. Someone at Vox.com wrote about Clubhouse. I've written about Clubhouse. Um, we believe there's probably room for multiple stories about certain topics. Is there a daily meeting or a weekly meeting where you all get together and hash this stuff out? Or is it all pretty much backstopped by the editors? Yeah, it's, it's pretty fluid, right? Um, we, we, we have a weekly meeting, um, but it's generally not to talk about here our stories we're writing. I mean, we generally we rely on Slack to sort of like let people know what's happening. And again, we have a small group and, and it'd be weird if someone was writing a story no one knew about. More with Peter Kafka when we return. Peter, how do you decide what to cover? Because there's probably more things you want to cover than you have time to cover. Yeah, that's a very good question. Sometimes it's, am I animated by the story? Do I think it's interesting? Do I think it's new? Um, sometimes it's very quick, like, oh, this is in the news and I have particular expertise or insight that I can add. Um, sometimes I really want to cover a story, but I've already made commitments to do other things and I can't write about it. Um, especially now that I've been doing some more projects. I did this uh, uh, with my co-host, Ronnie Mola. We did a, a, a seven-part episode, seven-part podcast series about Netflix uh, last spring. Um, and we were working on that, finishing that during the beginning of the pandemic um, into the George Floyd protests. Um, and there was a real tension there between, you know, should we be writing about, you know, how our various beats intersect with the pandemic or with racial unrest um, versus working on this podcast about Netflix. And so there was some real tension there about, you know, how can we do multiple things? Um, but in the end, you can only work on so many things at a certain time. And, and we put the podcast out and it worked out really well. And I think everyone's very happy with it. So, so you've got the podcast, you do news stories. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do these extended seven, you did a seven part feature story on yeah. Netflix. Do you have a sense just beyond the topic for what formats seem to do the best right now? Or is it, is it not independent of the topic? Um, it really depends. I mean, we could, you know, we made a good seven part, seven part podcast series about Netflix. Um, Netflix is a company that a lot of people care about because they, use it um but we could have made a boring one a bad one and people wouldn't have paid attention to it um we were really pleased with it um you know you can yeah you can always do google trend searches and stuff to sort of gauge you know what what you think an audience is for that stuff but i find that pretty circular and not helpful logic um if you're writing about stuff because it's popular then you're kind of only going to write about certain things and i think everyone in digital media and media and broadly has a version of that challenge um yeah, it's a long-winded down answer. Well, I mean, clearly in entertainment, that's what drives the sequel. You know, the the sort of this idea that there's a built-in audience and sure. you know, you're guaranteed. And and obviously we know, you know, social media impacts coverage decisions. Um, so so how do you sort of specifically use social media to sort of keep your finger on the pulse of what seems to be trending with your audience? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not um you know, I, I worry that I consume too much Twitter as it is, and it gives you a skewed perspective of what people are interested in, because I end up following a lot of people who have similar beats as me or interested in similar stuff as me. And you worry that when people are excited about a certain thing on Twitter and in, in the audience, in your sort of self-selected audience, that you're actually getting a skewed version of the world. Um, in the same way that, you know, there's, there's a very kind of lazy journalism that says this topic is trending on Twitter, let's write about it, which even in the best case scenario, I think would be a little facile. Um, and it's because we know trending topics can be manipulated anyway, it's, it's really useless. But, you know, those are also easy stories to write. So, you know, I think we'll make them. Um, I don't track my individual story page views. Um, that stuff's available to me, but I don't find it terribly useful. I try not to overestimate um, someone on Twitter telling me they like my story, um, but I definitely do respond to that. And the rest of it's kind of a crapshoot. You can see sometimes when a story really takes off and gets picked up um, just based on Twitter feedback or sort of seeing stuff pop up in Google searches. But even then it's, it's hard to sort of understand what people are responding to in the story um, and or how much the method of distribution of the story had to do with it. If it gets picked up by Apple News or Google News, that's, you know, 
that can really magnify uh, the audience for a story, but not necessarily, it's unclear what, why they're doing it. Um, and then sometimes just shit happens for weird reasons. I wrote a story about Disney writing down the value of its uh, stake in Vice, just based on a SEC filing and, you know, it took me five paragraphs or something, banged it out. And, you know, it's, it's literally a story about accounting, but there's a very large group of people who enjoy uh, the schadenfreude of Vice not succeeding. So that story did very well, but I don't think it's because there's inherently an audience that's a large audience that's interested in, in uh, big media M&A accounting. Um, so it's not, it's not something you can go back to over and over. You know, if, if they said, keep writing more of those stories, I'd say I can't do that until someone else writes down a loved slash hated new media darling. I, uh, I spent the first uh, uh, many years of my career in PR and I used to think that I could tell which clients that came to me would, would get covered, mm -hmm. but I really never could. I could never really predict, you know, some that I thought were not newsworthy wound up getting a ton of coverage. Yeah. And then some that I thought were hugely newsworthy, got no coverage. How is your barometer for predicting the success of a story? Um, less good than it used to be. Um, you know, there was a time when, again, and part of it has to do with sort of who, who you're working for and what the audience they have. But, you know, there was a long time where anything you wrote that had Apple in it in the All Things D days would do well because people really cared about Apple. I think in general, the sort of passion for stories about Apple is, is diminished overall. Um, and then, you know, like the Vox.com audience doesn't have the same level of interest in Apple stories as an All Things D uh audience would have um and then yeah you don't really know um you know for you i was interested in youtube uh for a long time and would write about it quite a bit and then there was never any audience for those stories and i was confused because or it's not usually a large audience I'm like I, I understand that you know most people who use use youtube aren't interested in the business of youtube that i was writing about on the other hand it had two billion users and you'd think all right some of them might want to read about what's going on behind the scenes um, and paid less attention to it, I think in part because it just was not getting a lot of traction with an audience. And then at various times, um, YouTube will be back in the news. People will be very interested in it. And I think also some of the YouTube user base has grown up a bit and there's a large class of people who are making livings on YouTube or aspire to do so. And so they're more interested in reading about that sort of stuff. So that waxes and wanes. Could, could you uh, venture a guess on why those stories didn't, you know, resonate with a larger audience? Um, again, it might've been that, you know, I think YouTube's audience, I think the YouTube user base is fairly young. And so they may not have been that very interested in sort of, uh, uh, you know, which VCs were doing well, trying to create YouTube businesses. Um, yeah, it, it, it is, it's, it's hard to tell. It's again, um, I try not to overthink a lot of it. I mean, if you really want to generate a ton of page views, I think most people still know how you could do that. But I think there's not that much value in creating page views for page view sake. Um, and you've got to periodically find stories that people don't know they want to read and, and find ways to compel them to read it. So then what are sort of the KPIs for assessing the success of a story? Yeah, I don't, I'm not really... I'm not really KPIing my stories. Um, it's well, it's somebody my, is. My, no, they're not really my my personal end. I mean, they some sometimes my editors will say, "Oh, people really read your story about such and such." And I'll say, "Oh, that's good." Um, but I want which stories. means what? Which means time on page, or or they entered the site through that story. What does that mean? If a I lot of people it, read I the assume story. it means page views. Um, but again, I'm not tracking it. You're um, not. You're not looking at the stats. Uh, for the I'm site. not. I'm not, I, I'm using my own internal barometer for the most part. Is this a good story? Would I read this story? Would I share this story with someone else? Um, that's usually my best barometer. Um, I, I do like feedback. And so if people are sharing my story on Twitter or writing to me about it, that's important. It matters to me who is paying attention. It matters, are the people I'm writing about paying attention to, to what I'm writing? Uh, which can be a trap because you don't want to write for your subjects and you don't want to write for such a narrow audience that only people who are involved in a specific industry or a specific company are going to read your story. Um, but 
it still matters to me whether that, that that's meaningful. Um, there can be other indicators. You know, it's, it's sometimes we would get a kick if we wrote a story about a public company and that moved the stock for some reason. Um, but again, you know, that's not really the business we're in. We're not, we're not at the wire and we're not Bloomberg or Reuters. Um, but it's interesting when you get that sort of, um, when you do get that feedback that people are paying enough attention to what you're doing to, to buy or sell something. What sort of data, if any, is sort of driving, um, who you decide to book for your podcast or which um, you decide to go with shows it's yeah, there's no podcasting is a pretty data free place. Um, it's very difficult to get even in, on your own stuff, a good sense of how people are consuming and you can get download numbers and some limited engagement numbers. Um, you know, the podcast audience is growing. So your podcast audience should be growing. Uh, if it's not, that's a problem. Um, the difference, be, you know, I, I, for a while thought, oh, if I get a celebrity or a famous person on my podcast, it'll do better than someone who's, you know, an industry person. But for my podcast, it, again, it's hard to tell, but based on feedback and the limited numbers I can see, I think generally my audience wants to hear, or is more interested in hearing me interview the CEO of Complex, who most people have not heard of, than they are than when I do an interview with Jimmy Kimmel. Um, and I, I think it's mostly because Jimmy Kimmel's audience isn't particularly interested in hearing me interview him. He can be accessible lots of places. Um, and as much as I try to do a good Jimmy Kimmel interview, um, you can probably get versions of that lots of places, but me interviewing the CEO of Complex, who's a fun interview anyway, um, I think that's that's a, a harder thing to find, at least for the audience that cares about it. Um, uh, but my, my other criteria, just like, who do I think will be a good guest, period? Who, will, who do I think will be interesting, will be interesting to talk to, often means that it's, it's a person I know or have spoken to before. I'll have some kind of rapport with them um, that I know can tell a good story. There's people, people, there are people who've been pitched to me. Um, and this happens also for onstage stuff who are important people, but dull as hell. Um, and, or work in an environment where they can't speak honestly or entertainingly. Um, so it kind of doesn't make any sense to have them on stage or in a podcast if they're going to give me very rote answers. Um, and some, in some cases, that person is still so important that you want to have them anyway. Um, but it makes for a, a kind of deathly interview. Have you ever uh, wound up with one of those on the show? Sure. Or you didn't know you booked them and it's like, oh my God. Uh, usually even in those cases, I know what I'm getting. Of like, this person is pretty stiff but they run an important company and so we're going to do the interview anyway and it may not be that illuminating but we're going to do it um but generally i'm trying not to, uh, generally it's i am my expectation is the person who's coming in to speak with me will be an entertaining guest how do you screen your guests how, how do, you, do you sort of look for podcasts they've been on before and listen to them and see if they sound good or yeah, again, these are often people that I have spoken with in the past. So I know personally that they're fun to talk to and interesting to talk to, or I've heard them somewhere else. And how do you prep? Uh, because they're people that I know, and it's an industry that I know, um, it's not heavy prep for me. I mean, sometimes it's some light Googling on the way into the office because I've got a set of questions I want to ask them anyway. Um, if it's someone where I really don't know anything about them or what they do, it probably didn't make sense for me to book them to begin with. So um, obviously there's probably stories you, you have to cover because they make sense to cover and there's stories you cover because you really love those types of stories. Uh, what kinds of stories do you like to cover most? I don't know that there's a type, there's a, the type of writing I like to do is where it's closest to my podcasting or conference hosting where I have expertise in this. I know something about what's going on. Um, I don't know everything, but I know enough to ask good questions. I know enough to be able to push someone when they're not answering a question and to translate that for my audience. So I think that is sort of my sweet spot where I can say, so-and-so says this, and this is what this means in English or so-and-so said this, and this is the rationale for the deal, but it actually makes no sense at all, and here's why. Um, not necessarily that it has to be confrontational, um, but I think that is where I do best, is where I'm able to explain things that are relatively complicated or obscure, 
or maybe intentionally uh, obtuse um, and say, here's what's really going on. You mentioned Michael Lewis in the beginning of mm-hmm. our discussion. Who are some of your other favorite writers? Um, boy, I, so I should say journalists, now. favorite yeah, business journalists. Well, top of my head. Um, I know it's not trendy to say this, but I was really influenced by Malcolm Gladwell as well, um, especially at, at the beginning of his career. Um James Sarawecki, who is now writing for Medium, but he was the New Yorker sort of finance writer for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was really, I thought he was really sharp, is really sharp. Um, Rob Walker, who used to write uh, about a bunch of different stuff for Slate and now is a freelancer, I think also writing for Medium, who writes about design and culture and technology. Uh, I really appreciate his stuff. Used to, I used to love to read David Carr he sure. wrote uh, that column, The Media Equation. Yeah. And I just thought he did such a good job making complex topics easy to understand. Yeah. And also it was a very, um, it was, he was imbued with his personality. And also at the time that he was writing, the, the Times was really sort of stuck between, you know, its old Timesian way and, and the internet. And he was an interesting bridge there. Um, and so even him, writing about anything that had to do with technology. I think the people in the tech business were sort of very excited when David would sort of wander in and, and, and mix it up. And Ben Smith um, has done a really great job carrying that legacy on. Very different voice. Um, is not David, is not trying to be David, um, but is definitely trying to use the power of that platform to shake things up um, and has made a point of, of uh, frequently writing about the goings-ons within the times as well. Well, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on how they're doing over at the New York Times in terms of adapting to the new world? They seem to have adapted really well, right? I mean, 2010, sober-ish people were writing stories predicting the Times might go bankrupt. And they weren't completely fabricating that, right? They had to take out a high interest loan from Carlos Slim to, to keep carrying on. They had to mortgage the building. Um, and they were really struggling with it. And they, were, they hadn't figured out a paywall, non-paywall. They were vacillating back and forth and cut to now. And you know, they've completely changed their business model from advertising to subscriptions. Um, they have the capacity to go out and hire kind of whoever they want. Um, in part because they've got a lot of money, but also because the time's stature has only increased, I think, over the last five, five years or so. So they're, they're crushing it. In terms of any of the, the new, sort of new formats, like the, um, uh, the infographics that they're doing or any of the, the sort of VR experiments they've done, anything there you think have, have a potential? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, there was that period, there was that minute where the times, did the snowfall era of the times where they got so much credit for making, you know, packaging up with, with nice graphics. And I think they do it so often now that people don't pay attention to it. I'm quite impressed. There's a format they do often where they'll take apart a part of video and, sh- you know, something complicated like uh, uh, the Capitol, Capitol riots on January 6th. And they'll, they'll really smart um, sort of explaining who's in this picture, who this person is, where they came from, what crime they're accused of. Um, and it's so regular now that no, people don't even bother to sort of point out how, how brilliant it is. Um, but, you know, a lot of the stuff that's a gimmick is a gimmick for a gimmick's sake. And I think what they're trying to figure out right now is what their future is in TV and video, which they've been trying to figure out forever, and what else they can do in podcasting beyond the daily, because that's one giant success. And they've been trying for some time to figure out how they can have more dailies or even things that are half a daily. And one thing they've done is gone out and hired my former colleagues, uh, Kara Swisher and, and Ezra Klein to bring their popular podcasts over there, which is one way to do it. Let's, uh, let's pivot to small media, niche uh-huh. media. Um, are there any sort of smaller, lesser known blogs that you keep your eye on? No, I definitely had a habit earlier in my career where I'd say, all right, getting up and I'm checking these six or eight sites, you know, one of which would be the New York times. one want to be something else. Hey there. And, uh, and then these are these five blogs I'm com- I, I need to pay attention to like paid content.org or thoughts all these. Um, but now so much of that stuff is in Twitter that I just sort of expect it to come to me 
um, and will be in my Twitter feed one way or another. So the idea of going to someone's site to see what they have to say seems kind of antiquated now. What are some of your favorite podcasts? Uh, I'm a comedy nerd, so I like uh, some very specific things. There's one called Improv for Humans with Matt Besser. He's one of the founders of the Upright Citizens Brigade. Um, another one called Comedy Bang Bang, sort of similar vibe. Uh, I used to listen to Bill Simmons a lot. Um, him, him and Adam Carolla were early in podcasting. Um, and that influenced my eagerness to get into podcasting was just listening to them. Um, and now I'm try to have an open mind and try to, uh, make time to listen to a new podcast periodically because someone will recommend it to me. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to break habits. I find that when I'm working on a new project, if I want to bone up on the topic, I'll mm -hmm. just check in. I'll use a, a podcast as a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Sometimes. Um, but you know, uh, you can't be text. You can go as fast as you want in text. You can skip ahead. You can, you can go back and reread something. Um, and at a pot, if you're listening to a podcast, it can be great. Um, and sometimes I will listen to a podcast guest speak on someone else's podcast first and get an idea of what's going on. Um, but it's hard. It's, it, it's a little kind of productive for me to say this, given that I podcast for a, a living, but, um, sometimes I find those aren't the best way to deliver information. They can be entertaining. They can definitely be educational. Um, but if I need to do a deep dive on something, I'm probably going to start with start and end with print. If someone wanted to get in front of you through a media outlet, what media outlet would it be? I mean, how, how, uh, um, someone wants to get in front of you. And so they're going to try to get media coverage in an outlet that you read. Mm. Wh which one would they, which one would be the one to go to? Yeah, I'm not, it's, I just don't have that level of verticality where I'm like, I'm reading the wall street journal cover to cover. If the wall street right. journal has an interesting article about it, I'll, It'll, someone will either recommend it to me or be, I'm already tracking it and I'll pay attention. Um, but just landing in random outlet or even the biggest outlets, it won't guarantee that I'll, I'll consume it. Um, who do you consider great, your, who do you consider your major competitors in the space? Oh, it's, it's every, it's everyone. Um, you know, there was a period where there weren't a lot of other people covering the business of digital media. Um, there's a period when, you know, not very long ago, the New York times was barely covering Silicon Valley. And that the reason that a lot of blogs like all things D and tech crunch and giga Ohm and we're all able to flourish because there's this big open space where, um, no one was covering that stuff. So there's a lot of, a lot of running ground. Um, now the times has a very big tech staff, the journal does uh, on, and then everyone from Digiday covers versions of what I do. Um, People within Vox Media cover things that I also cover, like my, I have colleagues at The Verge who cover some of the same space. So it's, it's pretty darn wide. You wrote uh, about Square's acquisition of title. Mm -hmm. uh, since many of the title artists don't own their own copyrights, yeah. what do you think is driving that deal? Well, that, that's one of those articles where I had fun. I was talking about an article where I could say, oh, I know something about the space. Let me try to cut through some of this. Um, I, you know, I think the, Probably it's both cynical, but probably realistic to think that Jack Dorsey thinks it'd be cool to have Jay-Z hang out with him and it'd be cool to do business with him. It'd be cool to have him on the square board. And he basically gave him a couple hundred million dollars to make that happen. And Jay-Z needed someone to take title off his hands because it's not an ongoing business. Um, people are doing a lot of thinking and, and speculating about it. I think there's probably going to be some sort of NFT offering involving title but again as i wrote in that story there, none of the things that square and title could do together require square to buy title so um you end up with sort of an extended shrug emoji what are non-functional tokens or non-fungible <laughs> to tokens well non as we're, as we're tokens. recording this they are they are uh in a, a huge uh investment hype bubble uh, they are in theory a way for you to claim ownership over some kind of digital thing. Um, and there's a trading card version of this that makes a little bit of sense. Um, the pricing doesn't make any sense, but you could say, oh, I own the uh, limited rights to this LeBron James trading card. Great. Um, 
I think that won't. I don't think that has a lot of application beyond sort of initial burst of speculation. Um, there's an interesting idea that this would allow creators to monetize their work more directly um, and to not have to rely on Facebook and Google and other mediators to take a big chunk of that. Um, I'm not sure how that will work. Chris Dixon, the venture capitalist at Andreessen Horowitz has a, has a blog post about that, which I find kind of intriguing. I'd like Chris to come talk to me about that, but uh, it looks like Andreessen Horowitz wants to do all their interviews on Clubhouse now. Um, so we'll see. Um, it's fun to write about this stuff and it's fun to have enough both distance from it. I'm, I'm not clinging. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not invested in how Bitcoin is doing at any given moment, but also have enough history to so have seen patterns and bubbles and different versions of an idea that you're seeing now. And it helps you be able to sort of put things in perspective. The challenge is you don't want to be overly cynical and say, Oh, this thing is like this stupid Q cat thing. I saw at Forbes, this terrible sort of dildo shaped thing that we read a barcode and like hook you up to the internet. And, and I'll see lots of things go, Oh, that's a Q cat thing and, and, and dismiss it. Um, some of the things that look stupid, that look like they're toys that look like they make no sense actually work or actually have some other use. And it's, you need to be, uh, you need, I need to remind myself to be open to that stuff. And what was this deal for about this, uh, piece of digital artwork that sold for, wasn't it $70 million or something like that? Yep. Yep. Um, what happened? Well, how does someone pay $70 million for a piece of digital artwork? I don't get it. Well, I think it's important to note that most people who are, who seem most interested in, in buying NFTs are already deeply immersed in the crypto world. And I, I wonder how much of it is them trying to sort of talk up their own book for their own version of what the world might look like. Um, I, the, the big question I have about anything that has the word blockchain in it, which uh, is related to blockchain is how is this better than what we have today? How does this, how, you know, how is buying something via the blockchain better than buying it with a credit card? How is using the blockchain to do this computer processing better than using it on a regular computer? And very often there is no answer for it. And that's when I sort of check out, um, you know, I can't opine about the merits of, of the $69 million digital artwork. Um, uh, I mean, is that real? You, th you think that's somebody making a market for crypto or making a market for NFTs? I do. I do wonder about how much of this is sort of self-dealing and round trips, um, but I don't know enough about it to, to uh, opine correctly. But I, you know, there's, we're clearly in a phase where, you know, we were at, we've been at this many times before where, adding the word crypto to it or blockchain or NFT excites a lot of people. Um, you know, my, my, uh, but you see it, you know, the clubhouse has gone through a version of that um, much smaller version of that. People get excited about something they want to pour into it. Um, we've also spent a year locked up in our homes. So we're more prone to, to, to these manias, I think than it would be in, in normal time. So we'll, we'll see. So um Tell us about this, these deals between Facebook and News Corp in the U.S. and Australia. Well, what's going on there? Uh, Rupert Murdoch has spent a lot of time over the years yelling at Google and then Facebook and saying, pay me for my stuff. Um, and it's dressed up with other language, but that's always what he wants. And he has gotten his way. Um, even if three years ago, I interviewed Mark Zuckerberg at an event and asked him, you know, Rupert Murdoch wants to get paid directly for the use of his content and then Facebook. Do you, what do you think? And he gave me this blank look, like he'd literally never heard about it and said, no, oh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Cut to more than a year ago, because it was a live in-person event uh, at the Paley Center. They had uh, in New York, they had um, Robert Thompson, CEO of News Corp on stage with Mark Zuckerberg announcing that um, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook was going to be paying News Corp for the use of their content. Um, and that's long story short, that's what they just announced in Australia as well, after some back and forth and also using the Australian government. Um, I don't know that that template is going to be one that Google and Facebook use around the world because it only matters apparently when Rupert Murdoch's involved, but I think they have concluded that it is relatively easy and certainly cheap for them to pay some publishers some money, um, for use of their content. Uh, and then they can go, sort of go up out and do their, their same business. 
You know, there's an interesting story um, that involved a, a media monitoring outfit called TV Eyes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of them? I, yeah, I, I've used their stuff in the past. Yeah. So, um, you know, they were sued by News Corp mm -hmm. and told you can't monitor our stuff. Uh, it, you're infringing on our uh, on our copyrights. And they won. And uh, basically everyone who was monitoring Fox was doing it to try to catch them and, you know, and lies. Mm -hmm. And so by winning that, that fight, they basically got themselves the rope to, to lie with impunity. I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean, I'm not familiar with the TVI's case, but um, their lies seem awfully well documented. If you spend a minute on Twitter, it's, it's just a, 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 at least my version of Twitter, it's, it's just a series of, of Fox News hosts and or people they're interviewing um, lying and the people pointing out their lies. I think Media Matters points that out all the time. Lots of folks do. Uh, my colleague at, at uh, Vox, Aaron Rupar, um, it's kind of his full-time gig to go monitor clips, at least during the Trump era of, of Trump falsehoods or things, stupid things being said on Fox and, and, and clipping them and putting on the Twitter. Uh for the listeners, if you'd like to support this podcast, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And uh, Peter Kafka, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Eric.